Welcome to Keeping the Beat, an engaging web series hosted live by the Tennessee Music Educators Association in partnership with the CMA Foundation. Tune in weeknights, Monday through Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time to learn from and interact with music professionals from around the globe, representing every facet of a vast world of music, like me. So today is Thursday, May 7th. My name is John Malinzak. I'll be your host for tonight. And I am uh, currently managing director of Note Flight, a Hal Leonard company, as well as a teacher of online uh, music education courses for many years. And uh, I teach at various universities and do a lot of professional development around the country. Tonight, I'm gonna present a session called Making Music Online, Create, Perform, Respond, Connect with Technology. We're gonna uh, start with a, a quick uh, PowerPoint uh, talking about uh, some of the, the ideas about how to engage students in all areas of our music standards using technology, obviously from home. And then I am going to play with some software and try to make some music uh, here tonight. I have no real plans for what I'm going to do. So we're just going to play and have fun and demonstrate some various lessons. I would love to interact as much as possible. So please ask questions. Uh, ask for specific uh, demonstrations at different levels. I'm happy to provide anything I can on this. So please interact as much as possible and I will be pausing throughout and checking for any sort of questions that come up. So with that being said, let me just organize some things here. So let's get going a little bit here. So let's talk a little bit about creating music with technology and essentially what that means, right? Um, as we know, we live in a society where students are addicted to technology, and we totally understand this. And it's not always a perfect situation, but we've been in this for quite a while. You know, I've done this presentation many times as well. And one thing that's a challenge for us right now is if we go back and think about how we as music educators consumed music growing up, many of us uh, use things called record players, right? And we might have uh, uh, memories of what, what this looks like. Let me get my uh, little annotation pointer here because that's fun. Let's see if I can draw. So many of us might have uh, used these for the young students these days. They might not know the joys of open a record or a lot of us really got our cassette tapes going. I mean, that was the, the era of, of course, the mixtape. Everyone made your mixtape. Uh, high speed dub copy from radio. You know, this was the original music piracy, of course, with with mixtapes. And then if you you know skip ahead, see what I did there. The transition to things like the disc man. We've been through all these various uh, uses of music and, and technology, and we've experienced music in a very different way. And uh, I think that's important to remember as we all embark on the way we teach and engage students with music online, because. Uh, now we're in a situation where ensembles are very difficult and we're all looking for ideas to teach students music and uh, we, you know, and the best way to reach them is, you know, meet them where they're at and expand from there. And to us, music and, and albums and, and listening to music, a lot of us had to do with pulling the big record out of the sleeve and, um, you know, at some point, uh, looking through the liner notes and in reading, you know, and seeing pictures from the studio and we listen to a record, you know, beginning to end because dropping the needle on a song is really hard to do in the middle. So you listen to side A, you flip it over, listen to side B. And, you know, so, you know, kind of fast forward to where we end up with, uh, I've lost my mouse completely. Um, you know, fast forward to where we end up with, you know, these uh, tapes. And many of us then experienced a change in the way we consume music because with the cassette tape, we were able to kind of choose and make our mixtapes and put songs in different orders. And then of course, with CDs, we could shuffle play, right? And then I have this idea of burning CDs, you know, we can mix CDs up. What does that look like? You know, from there, we get into a much different world. Um, I'm gonna clear all these drawings. We get into a much different world of you know, Napster, we remember downloading music from Napster and making our playlist. You know, we remember putting together individual playlists or even starting a download of a song at like right before you went to bed. And so it would take eight hours to download one song and 72 viruses for your computer. Uh, that computer, which had less RAM and memory than your phone does today. Uh, and then we'd put them on, we'd organize them into iTunes, we'd sync them with an iPod. We did a lot of work for music, right? Um, 
And we had a lot of control over what we listened to. And we curated what we listened to very carefully in a lot of ways. Um, now, today, we're in a very different situation because now there's Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music. Our students have grown up strictly in a Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora world. They experience music in a way that that is about, let's find the playlist. What's the most popular thing, right? We, as we curated our own music, we worked very hard at you know, having the popular songs, but we did a lot of curation. Now you open up your phone and what's, what's the hit song today? What's the most popular here? And we, we categorize music in different ways, right? We categorize music uh, thinking about how you, uh, you know, what's, what's music for running or music for a sad day or, you know, tired. and then we even let Spotify, particularly, which I use all the time, curate playlists for us and say, hey, here's some things you might like. There's all this discovery. Our students are so used to that world, discovery music, finding this area, and it might be new to us. But why that transition happened had to do with technology, right? Technology got faster, technology got more mobile, and technology has changed the way we consume music. So you think about in the same vein, how does technology change the way we learn? One of our most difficult things right now as music teachers and teachers in general, like teachers across the country and even the world, we learned with this type of technology. We learned with whiteboards, we learned with notebooks, we learned with overhead projectors, you know, walk in the class, it's 40 degrees hotter, the lights are off, the middle desk is taken out, there's the overhead. It's a good day, you know, you're gonna learn, the teacher's gonna sit in the desk and write on the overhead and. Um, and this type of technology was what we had available to us. And it completely and fundamentally shapes our approach to education. We naturally teach how we were taught. We, we understand learning in the way we learned. And today our students have much different technology and much more information at their disposal. You know, one of the reasons teachers had to write things on chalkboards is because the teacher had the knowledge and they had to write it down for the students to copy in their notebook. In the days of chalkboards and notebooks, the teacher couldn't send students to YouTube to see a video of something or find an article online that clearly demonstrates, you know, you'll go to Google Earth and see something you know, in real time. Just it's amazing what the technology is. So our students learn on different technology and one of the challenges that we have, all of us have right now, is we are in a lot of ways trying to teach with outdated technology. And we're trying to reach students who are very used to technology. And we have to figure out how we as teachers can make an adjustment here so we can reach students on all devices in any way. And a lot of this starts with ourselves. And it starts with an understanding that uh, the way we learned is not the way students learn today. Uh, and even starting in the past two months, the way we thought we were able to teach and learn has completely changed because now we're in all online environments and the fall is going to be very different with some sort of blended online in-person mix. And we're just going to have to adapt. And I think the, the best thing we can do is make a transition not to, oh, I have to do this thing with technology. The transition is student focused and student led. And, and the idea that as a teacher, you know, we're, we're used to, I have to figure it out, I have to learn it, I have to be able to do a thing before I can teach my students to do a thing. I'm here to tell you, if, if that's your approach, you're gonna be real frustrated for a long time because there is no way that we as adults can learn all of this technology and learn to be as proficient and comfortable with these resources as our students are. And we certainly can't do that before in the time frame for us to get proficient enough to create lessons. But what we can do is we can approach this with students and learn with them and learn the technology and the resources and empower them to be self learners and empower them to be lifelong learners with technology anyway, which is really important, which is why I think the respond and connect aspects of our standards are gonna be so much more important now because that's what we have the ability to do very clearly with technology. So I want to think a little bit about, you know, music technology. What do I use or what is technology in general? There's theory software, ranging software. I should have added a, a bullet here that says a free app to do virtual ensembles easily. 
which doesn't exist, by the way. Um, but music technology really comes down to one thing, and it comes down to creating music, right? Um, we perform a lot of music in education, but creating music is really key uh, when it comes to technology. So no matter what the technology is, it's giving the student the power to create. And, and by creating, I don't just mean composing or creating beats and producing music. That's part of it, but just recording a performance, right? Just the ability of student to, to instead of performing live, to record, even if it's just grab, grab their phone and pull up voice memo or whatever it is, that's a creation. Now I've created something, something that can be shared, uh, something that can be evaluated, something that can bring, bring joy to others. And I think that's what's really important. So student-led instruction, right? We are a lot of teachers that I talk to and work with in my courses and different professional developments. The, the first approach is how do I teach? And I would say, how do you facilitate? How do you facilitate learning? How do we facilitate learning with students? Let's be facilitators, right? Um, Project-based. Project-based learning, obviously we're doing project-based learning now, right? We're trying to engage students in, in projects they can take on. Um, but I always talk about project-based as a process-focused approach too. The project is great, but the outcome, the product produced on a project, whether it's a, a, pr a produced piece of music with recording, maybe it's a composition, maybe it's a video performance or whatever it is, the product is not as important as the process of learning. Learning happens through the process, right? The product is this beautiful, tangible outcome that you can share and promote and you can be proud of, or, and we'll demonstrate this later, maybe you make a composition that you're not proud of, that's maybe not great, according to someone's standards, right? Um, but you learned a whole heck of a lot about music during the process, and that's okay. So as we approach students and facilitate student-led instruction at home, it's important to remember that we just want to embark on a process. I mean, I know reaching students alone is very difficult, especially in situations that students don't have technology. So if we can just get students to engage in making music in some way that's meaningful to them, that also allows them to learn more about music and about themselves, I think that's extremely valuable, right? So I kind of have this, um, this um, process of collaborate, feedback, and grow. Collaboration, feedback, and growth. I think it's very important, um, always in class, but even more important home and more difficult, admittedly, that students collaborate with each other. It is so easy to give an assignment and have a student turn it in and you grade it. I get that, but we cannot be isolated. Music, and the arts bring people together. They bring joy, right? Music brings people together, concerts, events. We, we get together as a society around music performances. And so as music teachers, it's so important that we work extra diligently to find ways to get students to collaborate. And I'm gonna show a couple of collaborative online learning tools. The good thing about the internet is we collaborate a lot. That's what the internet does, right? We connect to each other through social, uh, the internet's a social place. And so that's good for us. Feedback is important. I'm deliberately saying feedback, not assessment and not a grade, right? We collab get students collaborating. Feedback happens. Student to student, teacher to student, give feedback. And then you grow, right? Growth is important. Now, I'm not saying change because of feedback. I'm saying grow. Grow means uh, grow the value of the, the material you're working on, grow in your ability to perform something better, to sing something better, grow in your ability to be more comfortable performing to others, but also grow as a person. Learning music and creating music is just as much about learning about ourselves as anything else. I can tell you personally, as a musician, a performer, a writer, a ranger, everything I've embarked on musically, when I've been blocked, it's been blocked because of, of, of me, of, of maybe my insecurities or my, and my self doubts of my abilities or, or you know, my fear of putting out what I have for the sake of perfection. All of these things that our students struggle with and we struggle with as teachers is, is um, a lot of it's more about yourself than it is the music and you'll find that. I mean, think about how scared we are as teachers right now to put out an online lesson because we're not sure if we're doing it right or what does it mean, right? 
those are our fears, right? So we, we take this opportunity to grow as humans and grow as people because music changes lives and music allows students to grow. So let's get them collaborating, let's get feedback and let's grow. So spoiler alert, create with technology, feedback, respond, right? Collaborate and growth is about, you know, connecting to yourself and, and the real world. That's where this comes in. The other thing that's really uh, valuable when you're creating music is we have the ability to use popular music and we have the ability to use culturally diverse music, right? We as teachers like certain things. I listen to certain types of music. You listen to certain types of music. We don't listen to every type of music that all of our kids listen to, and that's okay. But what's really important is that we try to avoid bias, right? We try to avoid lessons that are about like, you know, 80s rock, because I grew up and I really loved 80s rock. And I would listen, you know, and are like even alternative 90s music, you know, and so like I was a huge Green Day fan and all that, you know, and that's really cool. Your students might not know that music. I'm really comfortable talking about the music that I enjoy. And admittedly, I'm less comfortable talking about music that I don't listen to that my students may listen to. However, we are facilitators. It is really important, even in this time, if, if, if letting students explore their favorite song, whether we as teachers know it or even like it or not, gets them involved and actively wants to create music and take time when they have so many other uh, choices of things to do at home, but they want to get involved because of that, it's really important. And I think we also have an opportunity to, to engage students in, in all sorts of culturally diverse music. It is a huge, huge bummer that we don't have our ensembles. I will fully admit that. I grew up in music ensembles. I miss my ensembles. It is, it is devastating in a lot of ways. So I'll, I'll preface with, you know, with that. But now we have a free and clear blank slate and there is no repertoire list. There is no approved festival list. There is nothing that's stopping us from teaching and engaging students with any type of music in the world. And I'm not even trying to be dramatic. We now have an opportunity online to engage students with any type of music that exists in the entire world. And that is so powerful, right? Because we have these amazing online tools like YouTube. You could find and students could study and watch performances of music from every culture. And this is the time to do that. So I just always wanna say that when we're creating music, we as teachers are facilitating students in creating and we need to meet them where they're at. We need to teach them about the classics. We need to engage them there, but we meet them where they're at and we should work extra hard at ensuring that we are including music of all cultures, especially the cultures represented the students in our classroom. And that is, this is a prime opportunity to do that. And we'll show some lesson ideas for that as well. So there's two things I think we could use in this time. Digital audio workstation. Students can now produce uh, music, record music, use loops, samples. I'm going to show a sound trap tonight because it is web-based. It is uh, available so students that have internet access with a Chromebook or an iPad or anything like that can have full access. I think using a digital audio workstation is extremely valuable. And I think we also need music notation software, which is also extremely valuable, right? Students can now, um, first of all, read music online, be able to play back and listen, be able to create and write music. And more importantly, adapt music for their needs because now we're looking for rep that makes sense for a student home alone to perform. And you know, the, the second clarinet part of that band piece or the alto part of any choir piece, no offense, might not be the greatest thing for them to sing by themselves and, and brings joy. Maybe that doesn't bring joy. However, they can find a cool solo piece and they can adapt it using notation, learning, having the ability to learn how to adapt music for their needs so they can perform it and bring joy to themselves is, is really valuable. I'm gonna show Note Flight tonight because it's web-based, it works on any online device and it is collaborative. Um, so before we get into that, I wanna talk a little bit about creativity because this is kind of where we're at now, right? Where we have the opportunity to engage students on being creative. What does that mean and how do we teach that? For a lot of us, in, including me, when I first started my music tech course, um, oh God, probably 10 years ago, I, uh, I didn't really know what this meant. You know, for me as a music teacher, I had taken um, music theory in college and grad school. And I was always, you know, I love the mathematical side of things. So like transfiguration theory or tone rows and I could retrograde and invert like anyone else. I thought that was so cool. 
I never liked the sound of that music, but, you know, and I, you know, passed the test with, you know, resolving a French old million six chord. I probably couldn't do that today, but, you know, I, the point is, is I only actually created music as a, as a, a student learning to be a teacher. The only time I created was when I was forced to, to demonstrate an analytical concept. And I bet for a lot of music teachers that that rings true. And uh, that's fine, no, no offense to higher ed at all, but we have to understand that we, as we now approach our students with creative lessons, that we don't uh, replicate what we did in college, but we engage them in truly being creative and, and enjoying music. And having said that, this, this image that I've had up for a couple seconds here, you know, this, this idea of there's left brainers and there's right brainers and the intellectual type gets up first thing in the morning and makes lists and gets straight A's and likes outlines and the right brain type is so kooky and draws really well and is funny and you know, has like eight alarms set in the morning and you know these right brain, left brain, the creative type. This is not what we're talking about, right? I just want to completely dispel any myth here that like that you're that some of your students can be creative and some don't because they are either a right brainer or a left brainer. I take a lot of uh, you know sometimes I take offense to that because what we don't want to do is is create a situation where we we have students think that they can't do something from the very beginning, right? Um, so now uh, what I'm talking about is the idea that a creative assignment is not simply about engaging the right brainers, right? We don't approach creativity as, hey, be creative. In fact, the term be creative is something you should be careful about ever using because to some students that's exciting. But if I asked you as teachers right now to, hey, here's a, here's a, a blank piece of paper, draw something, be creative. You feel nervous. I almost guarantee you feel nervous. Oh my God, what if I'm not creative? <gasps> you know, so creativity is not about inventing something new. It's, it's about structuring lessons where there's, that we take away the fear, right? And the fear we want to take away is the fear of being wrong. So um, I, uh, the idea of creativity and intelligence is creativity is intelligence having fun. And I think that's what we got to think about. Um, so um, I want to talk about a couple different types of creativity, because I think this is what really was mind, uh, really opened my mind to being able to approach students in this way. And this is the little last little bit here. There's a few different types of creativity we think about. And the one thing that we tend to fixate on is this idea of big C creativity, right? Large scale contributions that sort of change the way society thinks. And these are, you know, things like, I don't know, the wheel, fire, uh, Model T Ford, um, the iPhone, uh, Hamilton, the musical, you know, like these like, wow, they're so creative. They did something no one ever thought of before. That's amazing, right? And those are amazing. And society loves those things. But we can't have students assume that if they can't do those things, that they're not being creative, right? So we don't want to have that put that on them. So this idea of little seed creativity, everyday tasks that become creative. We're doing a lot of that now. I mean, this is more like these little seed creativity is, is in line with adaptivity and flexibility too. You have a plan to do something, but something changes. Like we're being everyday creative right now and trying to do our lessons online. But this is the idea that um, in your everyday life, if you plan on doing you know, having lunch at noon, but then a meeting comes up and something changes with your students, so you rearrange it, you know, instead of eating this, you know, there's a lot of little micro decisions that happen and we are shifting and we're being creative in a, in a very daily simple way. And we don't always think of that as being creative, but in fact it is. And in music composition, it can be rewarded, right? I can be working in sound trapping. I don't like this loop. How do I, how do I make this? You know, let me put a drop here. Let me try this. That's a creative process, right? And it's important to uh, encourage students about that. And so, you know, you are being creative by making every little decision you make is an act of creativity. Uh, so it's not about making something awesome. It's just making decisions, trying things and, and based on information. So then we get to the magic. I always say the magic's in the mini C, right? And the mini C is where we talk about like real exciting, where we get to interpersonal creativity. This is all about self-discovery. And I think this is the most important thing we can be doing right now because little C creativity gives us the opportunity to have students self-discover and feel extremely proud of what they did. Interpersonal creativity in mini C is essentially described as a moment when you figure out something for the first time. 
Um, and, you know, I could use an example of, you know, Hamilton the musical. Let's say that I haven't listened to musical theater in five years since 2016, 20, so 2015 and on, I've been complete. I've never heard a musical. But one day I wake up and say, wow, I bet I could write a musical, but use hip hop and talk about the American Revolution. That sounds like a great idea. You know, I just came up with a really creative idea. Now it's already been done, but what if I don't know it's been done? Am I any less creative than Lin-Manuel? I mean, obviously I am less creative than Lin-Manuel, but you get the point, right? How many times do students discover something for the first time that they're super excited about? And you can think of those moments like, Mr. Mrs. Mr. I just found this thing. That's what we want to drive to. We want to drive students to the mini C. We want to avoid saying, be creative. And if you're not, you haven't done something really amazing and you should feel bad about yourself. Because I guarantee that society kind of puts that on us already. When we have students create music, we, we celebrate every decision as being creative and we guide them to discovering something where they can come back and say, wow, that's so, so cool, right? So I got an awesome question here. I'm going to break before the next little bit because we're going to do some tips on teaching music creation. But let me read this question. Uh, do you think that the evolution of technology in relation to how we obtain our music has limited the amount of info students get about the music they are finding? Example, with CDs and albums, we had a wealth of info in the liner notes. Who's on the session, brief bios, the performers, anecdotes, historical info, album art today, download a song with basically no surrounding information. The students have a tendency to not research at all for that. Um, I love this question. I 100% agree. I remember my first CD, when I first CD player, and my first CD was Green Day Dookie, that album. And I would put in the CD player, I would lay on the bed, I would go through the liner notes, I'd read the lyrics of the songs, I'd look at the pictures, I was like, why are they wearing eyeshadow, that's weird. But I thought it was, you know, it was like, it was a cool experience, right? And I will admit today, music, um, we don't think about music as, as, a, as a really powerful story anymore. We kind of like, what's the new hip song, right? Um, I think about how albums come out. I, one of my favorite albums is uh, from 1975. Uh, it's A Night at the Opera by Queen. And it was really that breakout album. They fired the manager. First song in the album is, is amazing. Uh, and that, that album, you know, brings us beautiful son. It tells an amazing story. They let the drummer sing. You're like, thanks, Roger. You can sing a song about a car. That's awesome. You know, of course, that album ends been here in Rhapsody. But that album is a beautiful story. Uh, you think of Pink Floyd. There's so many other examples, right? Uh, Artists aren't, you know, some artists make albums that are stories, but now they have to compete. So yes, it has changed music. And I think this is an opportunity, right? So the, this is a great question. The opportunity is, you know, the way we approach that with students and in my experience is meet them where they're at and get them to where we want them to go. It's just like helping someone, right? Walking 10 feet in front of us, 10 feet in front of someone doesn't make them walk faster. Being 10 rungs up the ladder higher doesn't make them climb faster. If you really want change, if you really want to guide and facilitate, you meet someone where they're at and you go step by step with them. So we have to meet students at their music that, that might not have a whole lot of meaning, that the lyrics might not tell a great story. Uh, but we meet them there and we find some musical element to reach them. And then we step them towards another song that might have the same groove, but might tell a little story. And we, we get them to realize all this other cool music and how to actually do the research. So that's a great question. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, so I wanna go through a few teaching creation activities then I'm gonna actually have fun with music here. So five tips that I found super helpful in trying to get students to guide them to creating music for the first time. Um, short lessons, right? It's okay to have short scaffolding lessons, right? Nobody says a composition has to be a very long, drawn out, big product, right? And in a lot of ways, if a student's never composed or created something and pr produced music or recorded, you know, we, we put such an emphasis on the product in a performance situation. We work months and months and months, practice, rehearse, practice, rehearse to do a performance and just we focus so much on that product. When it comes to creating, especially with online lessons now, uh, especially with, you know, we don't know how much time students have to engage in all this, short lessons, lots of little, little bitty lessons that add are great and it takes the fear out. So today's eight measures, compose an eight measures melody. Play it for your mama, how big did she smile, right? Because I'm a huge believer that music is created to make the world a bit more beautiful place and music is not created for a teacher to grade. 
So I think it's extremely important that every little thing our kids do now in these lessons, they should go sing it or play it for their parents, their family at home. Because I tell you, any family at home right now, they're probably all stressed. They probably all got hair that's way too long. Y'all, I got my quarantine haircut. I can't tell you how much product I had to put in to get it tamed down for this. Um, but having their child come out and say, hey, mom, hey, dad, I'd like to share this thing I made for music. I, I don't know a parent that wouldn't just welcome that right now. So short lessons and praise each step. So a melody today, add one whole note tomorrow that sounds good with that melody or drag a beat in that sounds good. Now the next day, add another eight measure section that's different. Now the next day, play it for someone else and evaluate and give them feedback. Short little steps that have praise and encouragement each time. And it's really important, build off what you have. Creativity is not equal to originality. Nobody says creativity and originality are the same thing. They can be, but they don't have to be. Look at Disney. They're just remaking the old stuff with real people now, okay? So we've lost all creativity, but use music you might've been working on. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking at music in the fall, maybe start introducing the melodies of these songs. Have students bring in the, the hook of their a, a popular song they're listening to. But we use creativity is about adapting and managing and playing and learning from things that exist. So it's really important to, I mean, especially as in the early stages of creating and manipulating music, start with something that exists and just tinker with it. That's actually a really good way to, to do, to, do things. Now, um, focus on a skill. We're still teaching music, right? But so let's say we want to you know, think about how we're going to teach music and how we're going to read students. Well, maybe we focus on, you know, this, we're going to break down all the elements of music. And over the next two months, or even in the fall, we're going to give our students a true, uh, a true understanding of all the elements that bring together a song. Form, uh, harmony, tempo, texture, uh, instrumentation, um, uh, or orchestration, um, maybe counter melodies, maybe, you know, so, uh, uh, and then just the overall, like, you know, effect and, and emotion of music, you know, we can kind of break down these elements and maybe we're going to do a, a lesson on form or even something simple like melodic shape, you know? So the way we approach that is say, here's an, I wanted to create an eight measure melody. It can be in MIDI, it can be recorded, it can be in notation. And I want you to, to focus on a shape. And maybe create a melody that goes up and down that's shaped like this. And maybe create a melody that's shaped like this. Or maybe, you know, so just focus on melodic shape. But say, create a melody that goes up, down, up, or something like that. Let students explore. Let them be proud of it. Play it for their mama. Be happy. Record it. But then, then you've created the teachable moment. Say, wow, look at this shape. You know, and then use what students turn in for the next lesson. You know, Johnny's assignment did this. And Timmy's assignment did that. And look at how these different shapes play together. Look, if I take these two shapes and play them at the same time, they kind of work together. This is kind of a counter melody. You know, you can just scaffold this, but you want to focus on a musical skill, but you want to get students there through active music and fun creation. Um, <clears throat> and then this is the key. Create, perform, respond, connect in every lesson, right? At every step of the way, I think it's valuable that students perform that little nugget of an idea they've created and they respond to each other's work, that they become so used to getting feedback. Um, and they're always wondering, they're always being connected to the real world. They're always connecting to why is this skill? What am I doing right now? And, and connect is really important right now because if students are producing and composing music, we can directly relate those to jobs in the music industry. How, why would a composer do this? What if you were composing a music jingle for a 30 second commercial? What does that feel like? And what does that look like? And so, you know, um, what if you're producing this for a film and you have to have a, a 17 second thing and you have to have a strong hit point at 13 seconds? You know, like you could connect these to real world events and connect these constantly. Connecting music to emotions is so powerful, right? Write the quarantine blues. That's okay. Just connect what do you you know anything that we can do to connect to ourselves right and so you have lots of opportunities there but this can happen at every step of the way too often we wait till the final thing is done to do the performance because we're used to preparing for long periods of time for a performance the, the the issue here is that especially when students are putting themselves out there for something new making music using different tools you know they're they're just as nervous as you are they're probably self-conscious about it so the longer we wait to start giving each other feedback and connect and even do a performance for your parents, uh, the longer we wait, the more difficult that becomes for the student. 
if we do it very quickly and you know eight measure melody that has this melodic contour great can you record it can you okay can you send that recording to a friend and name the top two things that you heard the best about that have three friends evaluate that great now how would this jingle be used or how did it how did it make you feel when you played this you know so how can we include these ideas and i'm going to show a little bit i'm a huge google classroom fan you know i have lots of course doing courses now and teaching google classroom but i use other things like schoology and canvas and too but whatever we're using to connect with students those online tools give us such a huge opportunity to engage students in discussions engage students in um in, in rich feedback that allow them to connect with each other online having a feedback form that connects students super valuable and the last tip is build confidence right as students are creating and doing this new thing we build confidence and we know as music teachers we know really well that we are first and foremost mentors cheerleaders uh absolute you know like uh, your student's biggest advocate. Because I'll never forget when I started teaching, I don't, I don't have a baton on me, but I had this, you know, great, perfectly balanced Mollard baton. And I remember, you know, trying to conduct my little fifth grade band and realizing that this doesn't actually do anything for them. But me saying, you can do it. You're so great. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's so good. The encouragement, the buildup, the, oh, that was so great. Can we do it? The biggest lie in band directing one more time and just make everyone fix two things. Oh my God, that was so amazing. I'm so proud of y'all. That is what we do as music teachers. That is what, that is how we change lives through music. We build students up into confident human beings by giving them a safe place to express themselves. All, that is what we ultimately do. And we can do that online too, but it just looks different because we can't go to their house and stand six feet away with the mask on and say, yes, enter that second note. Yes, put a drop in there, woo. You know, we're so used to giving this real time sort of like encouragement. So what does that look like when it comes to creative assignments? Well, it's about this, the feedback you give. It is making sure that you cultivate and facilitate positive feedback throughout. And I totally understand that it's very difficult as a teacher to sit here and give feedback to every single assignment with lots of students. But if you cultivate as part of the assignment, students have to respond to each other's assignment with the top two things that they enjoy the most. And you know, we can cultivate that type of confidence building, but we have to do it continuously, right? We can't wait to the final product if we just, just make it okay. Like it's totally okay. You're gonna create something, someone's gonna say something about it, and you're gonna, you're gonna grow. And that's totally fine. Like that's the way to attach this, right? So this next slide, the last slide I'm gonna bring up. I've always said that teaching a music technology course or teaching students to create is just messy. Creativity is messy, right? And it's, it's actually more true now, but I always bring this up. Like what does music technology look like? It looks like absolute and utter chaos and we feel completely out of control. But you know what? That's kind of how we feel right now, right? Um, so uh, with that, I want to jump in. I'm going to take this one question, then I'm going to switch over and start uh, playing some music and give some examples. Uh, here's a, oh, you know what? Thank you. Thank you for this question. I love me some assessment. I, I could talk about assessment all day long, assessment versus grading versus feedback. I actually took it out of this slide because I don't want to go on too long, but this is my school is not allowed to give grades, uh, which is, which is common. I know a lot of schools are not allowed to give grades. Right now, what are some ways to engage those students who aren't self-motivated to complete the work when there's no official accountability, right? Um, and, uh, and they don't feel creative enough to attempt it. This is a beautiful question. Let me just read that again. Uh, what are some ways to engage students who aren't self-motivated to complete the work when there's no official accountability and they don't feel creative enough to attempt it? I totally understand that there's a lot of students out there that do things uh, you know, for the grade and the grades accountability. I would just say to that question uh, specifically is one thing I think we could remember as, as teachers is that we've never taught music because of a grade, right? Uh, we, we have to inspire students to create music without fear. So I think one thing is that they don't feel creative enough to attempt it is the structure of assignment. I would say that too often, if we just really carefully read through how we present an assignment of students to create something, it's really easy to put put blockers in there. They, you know, and so um, 
for students that don't feel confident or creative enough, that's the, the idea of like, I don't, I'm not a creative person. We have to completely eliminate that from the way we present these things. So start by presenting known works. Present, I mean, I would, I would give them something in music notation and just say, hey, change these notes around and keep the same rhythm and see what it sounds like. Just something very simple. Give them an easy win. We have to build them up. So starting with an easy win like that, drag some loops, make some sounds and you know, whatever it is, um, that's a really good way to start it. And then the accountability doesn't have to be a grade per se, but the accountability could be, you know, share with your family, share with your uh, friends. The accountability is that sharing the music and getting praise. If we could somehow, you know, really encourage praise for, you know, any sense of accomplishment right now, um, I think that would be really, really valuable. So a grade is a sense of accountability, but if we can make the accountability, um, the praise they receive for something they created without fear, I think that's that's part of it. And I would really just think about how we structure assignments. Um, someone asked specifically about how note flight has changed. Uh, wow, we've I mean we've been we've been working more than we've ever worked before. The team has been uh, above and beyond uh, available to set up free demos, support teachers help do webinars. We are just, we are on the phone with teachers all day. We are keeping up. I mean, we're just trying to keep up with everything we can to support folks. So it's been really amazing. It's also given us the opportunity specifically at Note Flight to answer this one question is um, we've shifted to, uh, we've basically, you know, we have a huge development backlog and we're always planned, you know, at least three months out fully spec'd. And we always have a six month to a year roadmap of everything we want to do. It's, we're very, you know, trying to be very organized. Um, just threw all that out. It's all gone now. You know, we said, I said, look, we've got to, we've got to just fast track. We went through the backlog. We keep records of everything everyone ever requests. And we always have them organized. We went through the whole thing and said, what are, what do we need to do for teachers right now? How do we make this easier? How do we support? So we've actually completely reconfigured our entire development plan to focus solely on um, distance learning stuff. So we had some new features announced today. There's an email coming out tomorrow about that. We have a huge announcement coming hopefully tomorrow, uh, if not next week. Uh, we're fully fast tracking to support distance learning. I'm really excited to do it because these things have kind of suddenly bubbled to the top of our priority list. So we're uh, excited about that. All right. Um, wow. Time flies when you're having fun. I wanted to show a couple of examples of um, just how to get kids engaged in creating music and just sort of what the things I was talking about um, reflect tonight. So um, with that being said, let me share... Um, Where's my little Chrome and Chrome window? Let's do this. Let me share Google Chrome. All right, so I'm just gonna start in, in Soundtrap here, right? And um, starting here in Soundtrap, and let me pull up real quick. One thing that's common if you're teaching live ever, just self-narrate what you're doing so you're never just looking around at people wondering what you're doing. The chat window closed when I share my screen, so I'm just reopening the chat window so I can uh, easily be available for folks. Okay. So this is Soundtrap. If you haven't used it, I'm using Soundtrap and NoteFlight tonight. There's so many great tools out there. These are both uh, free through June 30th. These companies are being incredibly you know, generous to give away you know, all this content. You can just use it. So they're both free and available. But thing about Soundtrap is I, I like to think about how we can transition students to, to making music with themselves in a fun way. So you don't have the ensemble to sing with or play with but maybe you can just enjoy playing on your own. So let's take something as, as sort of basic and monotonous as maybe scales, right? And, you know, we do warm ups at home, but how do I warm up as a student in an engaging way? Well, I can, of course, let me turn this down just a smidge. Um, where I can go through all my scales, whatever it may be, but, how do, I, how do I make this a little more engaging? So something as, as, as fun as giving students the opportunity to customize their scales, or why don't we just make beats out of scales, right? So what if I went into something like Soundtrap here and took um, maybe a drum beat, you can kind of sample these here, and it's all drag and drop. And I'm just gonna drag this drum beat, and I'll let it play. Um, this is really easy. It's kind of cool. You can just make these shorter, make this longer. You can see at the top, it sort of has a, I'll close the loop section. These numbers are basically measures. So I just create a 16 bar phrase, right? And I can kind of extend the length of the project. So now what if I made like the, 
uh, a whole beat for the scale. And I can always change the tempo. So maybe I want to do this a little slower, bring it to 108. Um, yes, we're going to adjust the drum beat to match it. It'll automatically adjust the drum sound to match the new tempo. And now you can probably hear the metronome. I'll let the drum beat play a couple bars. Suddenly, now it just takes this whole thing to life, right? And the cool thing is, is at this moment, I would have students share this with someone, check out how I re-articulate, like make your own articulations and rhythms for the scales based on the drum beat. That's the whole thing. Simple. Let them do something that they have fun with. Share it with your parents. Listen to other people's things. Comment. Have a feedback form in Google about how, you know, how do you think the articulation and rhythm that they chose matches the drum beat? A quick discussion, start responding. Like that's the type of thing. Use short musical uh, activities that students can do on their own to engage them in discussion further. And I think that's actually really, really important here. Um, I love, and I'll show you one more before I give a demonstration of the forms. I love articulation exercise. I learned as a trumpet player, I practice everything with a digital audio workstation. And I could, I love doing articulation exercise with something like this. So let me just maybe go right to good old Clark tempo, 120. Let's adjust audio. So it's like a basic. Uh, faster to do that but suddenly you can just line up exactly like every articulation with the metronome and you can hear where you're behind ahead you see that was a mess right behind, behind all over but you can kind of sink in and see all of that and the cool thing is what we're essentially doing is having students practice with a a, a doctor beat with like the 16th on anyone who's with marching band knows that, but th that's not fun. This is fun, right? So the extension here is you can go as far as to do different drum beats. I've had students make like patterns where they can play melodies if they want to take a particular etude or a song they have. And it's like, make a, uh, make a drum beat pattern that goes along with this particular song. Is it a 32 measure selection? Great, then come up with 32 measures. Um, and then maybe change the type of drum beat depending on the mood of the section. Uh, you can even go into melodic loops here. So it's not just percussion, there's all sorts of melodic uh, loops in here so you can go into um, let me find something like synth uh, you can kind of hear there's all sorts of fun fun things in here there's all sorts of piano things in here so we can you know pull this in and you know as you get into it these are actually in keys and you can actually change the key of these as you need I and mean, it says right here it shows you it's in d minor you can actually change the key to match. So you can essentially, you know, create a chord structure. You can go D minor. Um, you can then add another loop and change the key up to maybe G minor and make the four chord. Uh, you could, you can create the structure. You could also have maybe older students. Maybe you have some, some AP theory students or some students in high school that could make these sort of structures for the middle school students. I mean, right now recruitment is so important. So if we can engage students with, with connecting with each other and responding to each other um, from, from different schools, and that's a perfect example, right? Create a project for older students to mentor younger students, have younger students compose and the older students can record what they composed for them, right? I just wanna always cultivate how we get students to connect with each other and how we get them engaged, which is really important. So you can kind of go on and on with Soundtrap. You can always, of course, just make, create all sorts of music. I love recreating music. Having students just recreate songs they like is really fun as well. Just get them engaged. Um, I'll show quickly how I like to, you know, structure these assignments. And I'm using Google Classroom, but these are very common tools um, in other learning management systems like Schoology or Canvas or PowerSchool or Moodle or Blackboard, whatever you use, right? Um, but Google Classroom seems to be very popular, and I, I love Google as well. I, uh, but what I like to do is nest uh, my projects under a topic. 
And this is for a course I'm teaching now. So these are some examples. But um, like, for example, the, the assignment would be the, the little composition. And this happens to be, I think, a little note flight assignment that they have in here. So they have to compose a quick thing. But I, I like to have students submit into a forum. So instead of turning in to me, I do have them turn in to me, as you can see. But I also, um, I like students to share with the class. So I create a question in Google Classroom and this, or discussion topic in Schoology or whatever. But I create a question where students can post their, their answer as a response to the whole class. This, and then there's a requirement that students have to actually give feedback to other people's works. And that's really, really invaluable. I also like, uh, when I think of connecting, I also like to include this, a discussion question that, that works with the assignment that gets students thinking. Uh, this particular composition assignment had to do with five notes. I used a basic uh, one, two, three, uh, five, six pentatonic scale. And they um, now I just want to get them thinking about what they remind you of. Because any student that plays pentatonic for the first time. <laughs> You know, they'll, they'll find and explore things pretty quickly on their own. So I've pretty much every time I've introduced, you know, composing or, or creating with a simple pentatonic scale, I get the, oh, that sounds like, oh, that sounds like. So I want to cultivate a really cool discussion that I can then use as a teachable moment. Say, oh, why well, does it sound? I mean, some kids said it sounds, you know, like sometimes they'll say like it sounds Asian or it sounds Orient because it has these, you know, say, yeah, that's kind of used in this. And that's a great opportunity to bring in music from other cultures. Uh, some kids sounds it says it sounds kind of jazzy, and so you can bring in that and say, yeah, if you really get in that minor third, but da 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 da, like that's kind of jazzy. So um, it's just a teachable moment, and, and the cultivating this discussion is really really exciting. Um, another tip on online learning, just as an aside, is you know we're not there for them to raise their hands and ask us at all times. So I try, no matter what the assignment is is to give a uh, supplemental material section of just like pre and like, what is everything I think they may struggle with and just give them a list of like links to whatever that thing is. So um, that's another, so this is kind of how I structure things. I'm not a fan of do this assignment, and turn it in. I'm a fan of do something, share it with the class, give feedback to each other. And with Soundtrap particularly, you can collaborate so easily. So it's really easy for students up here to share and then add a collaborator. And if you use their, you know, their EDU program, all the students will be, all your students will be pre-joined in. They can even share via a link. So this is the link they would post in that uh, Google question so that others can look at it. And suddenly you've created this collaborative assignment, right? And, and even multiple students can record their part, which is really exciting. So um, last thing I'll show is here is, you know, obviously composing a note flight and there's lots of opportunities for students to, uh, get engaged with creating and composing music. There's, of course, a bunch of libraries that you can get going with right away. Um, and this is all you know, free through June 30th, so you can have access to all of it. So there's existing content in here, full concert band, choir, orchestra, even pop music. So I can kind of, oh, I didn't want to do a new window. You probably can't see the new window, so let me do a new tab. Um, but I'll go into pop music. One of my favorite things is to play a pop song. There's 381 sitting here right now. So hopefully students will, will know one of these. Oh, I am California dreaming like crazy right now. So we can pull that up. Um, and you can adapt this for your students to play, right? You can check this out in Note Flight. Um, this is a good example of engaging students with something they already know. And maybe this could be a composition exercise where uh, write a new melody or copy the this melody into a new staff and write something that sounds good with it. Or you could do something as simple as adding a new part. And let's say I want to write a trumpet part to this. So you can just compose a trumpet part. Obviously, the trumpet part should be on the top, duh. Um, so now I can go in and maybe write a trumpet part. And it's in concert pitch right now. You can turn this off. But for kids, it's helpful. So maybe I want to do a little melody where trumpets can start composing. and. So maybe I want to do something like this. Uh, I'll do something very simple. Oh, I'm going to turn that off. So now I've created a little trumpet part, right? And I can play along and we can start from here. Whatever it is, right? So you can have, I mean, 
that's a perfect example of let's engage students just right away with just a simple addition to what they what already exists you know from there you can of course uh there's there's included um i'll go back sorry forgive all of my demo stuff here um you can also go and see obviously there's full concert band works in here <clears throat> and you can sort by genre and grade level there's also a bunch of included just um, melodies and lessons, you know. So I would say just really think about how you can use what's already existing to get students engaged. Uh, another really popular thing to do is these piano pieces are great. I mean, if you have kids that want to learn piano, that's obviously a, a great start. But um, I'm not familiar with Asteroids grade three, but it looks cool. Um, that's not a good example of what I'm looking for. Um, always pre-populate your examples. Uh, okay, so a cheerful chihuahua. This is probably more up the is what I want. So um, we could do something like this. So you could take an existing piece of music, right? And you could just turn this into an opportunity to create. So I could assign this to my students, but maybe I say, look, let's learn about call and response. And there's an initial melody and then there's a follow-up. So I'm deleting this stuff intentionally. So I'm gonna send this to my students and say, hey, you have to compose a melody on the treble clef line that supports what's happening in the bass clef. Have fun, right? Simple way to engage students to get going. And of course they can kind of go and compose as they want to. Kind of flying through some notes here, but um, See, this is where I'm, I'm, just, I'm just forgetting I'm on a, on a webinar and I'm just playing with music because it's fun. But um, those type of assignments. But again, what I, would, what I would do is I would start with a very simple existing you know, creative assignment. And then I would structure it in a way that has students share that with um, other students uh, to get feedback. Maybe share that music with other students. And in NoteFlight, you can just, there's this called score details. And you could share with anyone else. You can share with people on the site, you can share with groups. So this kind of works kind of like Google Docs, where you can just create or individuals, you can type in a username. Um, and so students can share their work and other students can have access and they can even give edit access. So other students can edit. You can make copies as you go. So you can just make another copy. So you could create your work, make a copy to share with a student. They could add to it, make a copy of that. That's another fun game. But the important thing is that it's not just about having the student create and turn into you. I'm a huge fan of having the student create uh, and share with another student and just cultivate this huge activity through these discussions, through follow-up conversations. And again, this topic, you know, as Google is a uh, uh, creates these. This topic can be two weeks, but it can have little sub assignments that create little small steps under that topic that really get us thinking. And I think that's the that's one of the best ways I've found to really cultivate, you know, the ability to create, perform, respond, connect in all of these lessons, because I think it's really, really valuable. So um, I'm a marching band person. So I'm a, it's a start on time, end on time, leave the field cleaner than you found it type approach. So uh, I will go ahead and, and wrap up today. Uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, a follow up here I have to read, but before I do that, I just wanna say that um, I think that you know, I've seen a lot of efforts out here to help support music educators and help support teaching online. And I, I've been just, amazed uh, consistently at watching what Tennessee Music Educators Association is doing, because I do not know of another state organization that is doing this four nights a week for, for weeks to, in, in the name, keep in the beat, to provide this going on. So I just, I can't thank Tennessee Music Educator enough and CMA Foundation for their support as well and making this happen, because what, what we have here is something really special. And so I, I want to thank both of those organizations TNMEA and, and CMA Foundation, because this is what we need right now. Um, I also want to thank the teachers who take time out of their evening or take time out of their day to watch these, because when, when the going gets tough and times get hard, it's real easy to give up and it's real easy to be frustrated. But if you're watching this right now, and if you've watched to the end, if you watch any of these, you are the one that is taking extra time out of your schedule to better yourself as a teacher so you can still reach these kids and change lives through music. And I would say never ever forget that we change lives through music. We don't teach virtual band. 
You know, we don't teach theory. Uh, we change lives through music. And we can do that with a Chromebook just as much as we can do that with an oboe. And I think it's really important that we just don't forget that. And we just remember that we just don't get too hung up and frustrated on the little details. Step way back and remember that we change lives and we are doing that. And if you're taking the time to, to listen and learn something new, you are going the extra mile and you should be very proud of yourself. And I certainly thoroughly appreciate you for, for watching this. So uh, with that, I really enjoyed uh, being here tonight. I'd remind everyone to tune in weeknights, Monday through Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time to, keep, to watch Keeping the Beat live. And remember to tell all your friends about the program. You can also watch these later. So if you'd like to grab uh, this episode or any other episode, uh, you can find them on the Facebook page and you can share out as well. Uh, please take a look at the upcoming presentations. They've all been wonderful. Take a look at past presentation videos. The wealth of resources here is just absolutely phenomenal. So thank you all so much. Uh, continue to stay safe, continue to uh, change lives through music.